privilege to be here and talking to my own uh, fellow country people. It's, uh, it's long desires have come true. When I came uh, on the 18th of this month and I have delivered a lecture at King Edward Medical College and I'm here and heading to Khyber Medical College in a couple of days. So this is what I would like to uh, give you some information. These are the basics information about spine and what are the interventions we do over there to treat and alleviate those uh, conditions. As uh, Dr. Shah has mentioned that I was and I am still his student and will ever inshallah. And he was our teacher over there uh, in King Edward Medical College. In 93, I graduated and went to US. And I started my career over there at Georgetown University Hospital in Washington, DC as a trauma surgeon. After a year of trauma surgery, my wife, she didn't like the lifestyle that going there at 5 in the morning, coming back home at 11, I switched to internal medicine. And then from internal medicines, I finished a couple of years of training. And then I said, okay, if I have to go keep the internal medicines, I have to go for either cardiology or endocrinology or something. And uh, I switched to physical medicine. Physical medicine over there is a standalone specialty, uh, which is a melting pot between uh, uh, from the orthopedic surgery, neurosurgery, rheumatology, neurology, all these things combined, you get it trained in all these neuromusculoskeletal disorders. After finishing my residency, that's a five year residency program. After finishing that, I did a two year spine and pain fellowship. So seven years after you finish your uh, MBBS here, and uh, taken your USMLEs in seven years total, and been practicing spine for the last uh, 16, uh, 15 years in Richmond metropolitan area. And among the few over there who are skilled to do all these procedures, which I'm gonna give you a little bit hint on all those procedures which I do, and the indications for that. So I have been given about one and a half hours, so I would like that if you guys have any attention span, if you need a break, let me know. I would like to go over as brief, briefly as possible, but in order for me to convey my message, you have to understand the basics. And we have the third year, fourth year students, so I think they have the fresh, their anatomy lessons from their second year, so hopefully they know more than us, because once we are in a practical field, we start forgetting the basics. So I'm going to the basics first, okay? I have no conflict of interest disclosing the, this presentation and the procedures I am going to talk about is all FDA approved. FDA is a Food and Drug Administration, that's a body in the United States which basically allow you to see if that going to be covered by insurance or not and plus also going to prevent you from any legal actions. Chronic lower back pain is a big problem in the United States. We have a population of 300 million plus and about three about 30 million people are suffering from chronic lower back pain. So, and about every year we have about a million episodes of lower back pain. It's a $40 billion industry in the United States. Every year there is a $40 billion cost on treating the back pain problems by multiple specialists. Lifetime prevalence is 60 to 80 percent. And people sitting in the first three rows are first two rows, 40 to 60 years of age are more prone to these problems. And there is a reason behind it. Why the people in their 30s, 40s, and 50s, 60s are more prone for lower back pain than other people. US adult population about 10 to 13 percent. I have the youngest patient, 13 years old female, has a big disc herniation. You cannot even imagine that. Why the 13 years old have that big disc herniation? But that happened. And I have the 1995 years old also patients have a multiple disc herniation, but they don't have the problem from that. So working class, 30 to 65 years of age, this is a major reason for them to be not to be present at the work or call sick that I can't because my backs gave out on me. So this is a big prevalence in the, in the country. And this is not the thing which is going to lead you to die from it, but it's going to lead you to have a difficult uh, life is basically a, your uh, morbidity. You cannot function if you have a back pain. In order to understand the back pain, you have to understand a normal spine of young age and the aged spine. This is a normal aging. 
you don't have to do anything I don't have to do anything but this is a normal aging process so let's go over a little bit here these are the paraspinal muscles in normal young looking spine in the like letter 8 or 10 rows your spine looks like this and front three rows spine approaching this stage these are the vertebral bodies intervertebral discs create the neural foramen and with once we start aging the trabeculae in those spine vertebral bodies they start getting thickening the cartilage start getting thickening too the end plates which I'll talk about later in detail also start getting thinner muscles start getting infiltrated by the fatty tissue ligaments start getting thicker they start getting hypertrophy and leading to the fissuring of this annulus and then all these spines start getting deteriorated look at this area of the spine this is called spinal segment and look at this spine here neural foramen where the nerve roots comes out and here is the neural foramen where the nerve roots comes out so these nerve roots and these are problems this is a normal aging process there's nothing you have to do or nothing I have to do to um, change into that so what are the possible pain generator what are the possible reasons where the pain can originate in the spine so starting from the soft tissue ligaments muscle strain or uh, muscle sprain or ligament strains these are the muscle uh, the ligaments you guys remember this supraspinous ligament interspinous ligament anterior longitudinal ligament posterior longitudinal ligament and the ligamentum flavum these are the four or five ligaments in the spine these are get strained with any abnormal movements and then we have the facet joints we call facet joint in the US but the remaining word they call it zygoapophyseal joints if you remember the superior articulating process of one of the vertebrae articulate with the inferior articulating process to make it a joint these are called facet joint they are the possible source of pain too then intervertebral discs which can be from the disc herniation or fissuring in the disc I will talk more about it and there's a new concept I will talk about this called end plate problems what can happen into these bones primary lesions can happen like a infection inflammation and then cancers and in later age in females or even male these bones start getting any fractures so compression fractures can develop so these are the sources of the pain in there and then don't forget the pain in the back can be referred from other sources you guys all know the kidney pain and the coronatus lumborum pain muscle and on the other side sometime in during normal menstrual cycle they feel the pain in their back so these are all referred pain so you have to keep in mind what is the primary source pain generators and what are the referred sources of pain one thing which you can take home today is a common concept if you have a back pain ask the patient go and take a rest for two weeks don't move absolutely nonsense two 48 hours to 72 hours is the maximum rest you can advise to the patient for acute lower back pain I'm not talking about chronic I'll go into further detail there so mobility early mobility is the key for lower back problems so ask two three days at the max okay longer you add the patient the tissue start getting deteriorated if you one of you lie on the bed in a hospital bed and do not move you lose one percent of your strength in per day one percent if you are hundred percent your strength will be 99 percent if you lie on the bed so that is why those people on, uh, having lying on the hospital bed for long they develop those critical illness myopathy or neuropathies they start weak then we need to have them rehabilitation done get them stronger so the same phenomena holds true for you as well now this is a chronic lower back pain chronic lower back pain is a pain which lasts more than six months from the day of it started that's called chronic lower back pain it is just an arbitrary number for legal and medical classification so if you have a pain resolved within three months we call it acute pain from three to six months we call it subacute pain and if it lasts more than six months is called chronic pain 
people who have a chronic lower back pain, even trying all these things, including physical therapy, medications, opioids, injections, nerve blocks, only 72% people still have the pain, chronic lower back pain. 26% are pain free and the 2% go for surgeries. That's a normal six months after, after the pain started. So just going over there now, if keep in mind that slide when I said the spine pain generators. So my first most common pain generator in your spine is your intervertebral disc. So intervertebral disc, what are the options I try before I ask the help from our surgeon's colleagues, okay, patient needs uh, this surgical intervention. So this is just an overview and I will go into more detail. Epidural steroid blocks. Those are the steroids you put into the epidural space right behind that herniated disc and we can put in a cervical spine, thoracic spine, lumbar spine or even sometime in a sacral spine asking the medicines to go travel up with the higher volume. We start doing the PRP treatment for the spine problems, putting the exosomes, putting the mesenchymal stem cells and putting the amniotic fluid allograft into the cervical spine and that helps patients. Few diagnostic tests we do, we call lumbar uh, provocative discography. We just like electrocardiogram, we take the picture of the shape of the electrical activity in the heart. These are called discogram. You take the shape and the picture of the uh, intervertebral disc to see where the problems are. And also there is a new concept called aneliogram. So I'll talk in more detail about it. Then percutaneous disc decompression, transdiscal biacuplasties, we do those things, and percutaneous endoscopic lumbar discectomies, disc decompression, and a new concept which is not in the market yet is called non-autologous fibrin. If you remember your intrinsic and extrinsic pathway, fibrinogen converting to fibrin, plasminogen converting to plasmin, that fibrin is very strong. So we are working to find and manufacture to see if we can inject that into the disc to make it more uh, resilient for any disc herniations. So second source of pain was a facet joint. So that was uh, the interventions for the disc problems. Now this is for the facet joint problems. First we confirm, okay, it's a facet joint uh, mediated pain, then by diagnostic or therapeutic blocks. And then we burn those medial branches going to those joints by using a conventional radio frequency method or by using the cool leaf radio frequency methods. And if both fails, then, then we put an endoscope and visualize those medial branches and then burn them. I'll talk detail on, on this. And doing those same PRP or MSCs, MSCs stand for mesenchymal stem cells. And we do also percutaneous synovial cyst decompression. And that is the cyst when the cyst develop in those facet joints and start pressing on the nerves. I've been doing these cases maybe 12 so far and uh, my goal is to reach to 25 before I present to the Na uh, North American Spine Society meeting. And then endoscopic facetectomies. These are all percutaneous procedure. You do not have to use a knife on these. Sacroiliac joint, same algorithm, diagnostic therapeutic block, radio frequency ablations and then using the exosomes intraarticular and periarticular blocks. We fuse the sacroiliac joint percutaneously by using I-fuse or cemetery uh, uh, units and sometimes I, I put those peripheral nerve stimulators just to cure the pain, or, uh, cover the pain. These are the more advanced interventions for all those problems. This is the intracept is just like we have done 200 cases in the whole United States so far. A new evolving concept of discogenic or the vertebrogenic pain. Percutaneous imaging guided lumbar decompression and then we put the interspinous spacers just to open up the spine for spinal stenosis both in the neural foramen and in the central canal. And those compression fractures I put the uh, um, kyphoplasty or vertebroplasty that is what we called percutaneous augmentation of the vertebral body by putting the polymethylmethacrylate the cement just for those compression fractures. Remaining are the spinal cord stimulators, which we'll talk about, and intrathecal drug delivery. And these are all other injections which we do. For example, lumbar sympathetic block for complex regional pain syndrome, Raynaud's disease, Burgess disease. So we block the sympathetic system in the lumbar spine to help to re um, heal that problem. Or we put the stellar ganglion block for upper limb uh, problems. 
So, this is the new concept which I'm going to be presenting it to you in depth and then I'll go into detail. These are called vertebrogenic pain. You guys have heard about the discogenic pain, facetogenic pain, but this is called vertebrogenic pain. What brought this in? Let's go to the disc again. Disc has three components to it. Nucleus, which is a central part of the disc, gel-like structure. What is the purpose of that gel-like structure? To absorb the pressure and distribute it horizontally to the other parts. What covers it is called annulus. Annulus are the collagen fibers which are arranged in a specific pattern of 25 to 40 degree just to absorb the resilience of this nucleus. So whenever there is a pressure, these annulus will stop it to go away from its normal position. So these are made of all the, pro uh, 60 to 80 percent is just the water. Water as we in 20s and 30s start evaporating and that evaporation leading to degeneration. Those discs which looks white on MRI, they start getting blacker. So you might see that on the report from those uh, our uh, radiologists, degeneration or degenerative disc disease. Degeneration or degenerative disc disease is just the loss of water in this nucleus which is about 60 to 80 percent. The remaining are all the chondrocyte like cells, proteoglycans and aggregates. Focus on this called vertebral end plates. These are the cartilage. Right above is a bone, which is a vertebral body. Below is a bone, between is a disc. These are called vertebral end plates. Vertebral end plates were ignored for a long, long time. That, okay, these are just the structures. We argued that, okay, is it a part of the disc or is it part of the vertebral body? So that was long ignored, but this becoming a focus or target now to see if that is a source of pain which patients suffer from this chronic lower back pain. One word to remember, this disc does not have the blood supply on its own. It gets nutrition through filtration or osmosis from the vertebral body. Vertebral body from above and below. That gives you nutrition to your disc. So smokers, when they smoke, they basically clot those uh, small tiny blood vessels in the vertebral body and their discs degenerate on an exponential curve. So smokers, whoever smokes, think that you may may not die from lung cancer but you're definitely going to have your lower back issues when you cannot stand and walk and sit for a long time. So remember nucleus, annulus, end plates. End plates is a target for this vertebrogenic pain. This is a little uh, pathology or the histology uh, of those nucleus. AF stands for annulus fibrosis. This is a nucleus pulposis. You can see this is a little blue and turn into lighter blue. That's called degeneration, N hydration loss. These are the collagen fibers. In the nucleus pulposis, these collagen increase in and this cross-linking increase. Elastin fibers goes down in the annulus fibrosis. If you're looking the cells, Nice looking cells, both in nucleus and annulus, they started becoming apoptic, nescence, necrotics. These are all normal aging process, okay? So the, this is what happened when from normal young matrix, young cells to old looking and old matrix. So the novel concept is that if the annulus and the nucleus, there's a deterioration starts, they start talking to each other, the blood vessels and the nerves start growing into the annulus, annulus fibrosis, because fissuring start. This, this uh, chondrocyte cartilage is start getting thinner. This is an old concept or still valid concept, I would say, before this vertebrogenic concept coming into, uh, into the, our equation. When these discs have those fissures, these nerves develops into those fissures, they become chemically and mechanically sensitive. Chemically, if you inject the lidocaine, people complain a lot of pain for that 10, 20 seconds. Mechanically, if you ask them to bend a twist, they're going to feel pain because that forward flexion with rotation and lifting produce a lot of pressure. If you have to see how much this disc holds pressure, bending forward increases pressure in that disc. Bending backward decreases the pressure in that disc. So increasing pressure is going to provoke the disc pain and decreasing pressure will relieve the pain. 
little anatomy again spinal cord nerve rootlets posterior anterior and posterior make the spinal nerve and this divide into ventral ramus dorsal ramus from the dorsal ramus there is a nerve come called sinovertebral nerve sinovertebral nerve this nerve innervates the, okay this is the disc nucleus annulus so this sinovertebral nerve innervates the outer part of the annulus then this sinovertebral nerve give a terminal branch called a basi vertebral nerve which enter into the neuroforamen from here so this is the novel concept now that this sinovertebral nerve may may not be as much proliferate into those fissured or damaged discs as this basi vertebral nerves are and we have found that the substance p is in abundance on on those nerves endings and substance p you know that it's present in all those patient who has a pain so this is the end plates here this is the vertebral body nutritional arteries and veins come from right in the middle of the posterior of the spine and along with that sino uh, basi vertebral nerves they go divide into the posterior one third and goes separate and cluster and make the supply to this uh, superior end plate of the vertebral body same thing branch goes to the inferior end plate of the vertebral body and like i said these are substance p positive this is the mri looking that normal hydrated disc nucleus and annulus this is the nutritional artery where this nutritional artery enter along with the uh, basi uh, the basi vertebral nerves now this is a little histology of that in those fissured or cracked end plates you find there's a lot of nerve growth is happening there you can see the number of the nerves in the area where this end plates are fissured it is found that okay that could be the source of pain in the spine instead of like we are targeting that disc 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 now we know that okay maybe the end plates are the weakest link instead of a disc disc is a weakest link if you see this is the disc and the bone uh, bone marrow from the vertebral body you can see nice looking transition happening this is the bone uh, the bone marrow here the end plates and the nucleus so similarly when the end plates start becoming thinner the permeability increases in that when the permeability increases the bone marrow lesions and erosion start happening at the site of end plate damage you can see the bone marrow this is all bone marrow with the end plates this end plate start getting damaged because there's a crosstalk happening between the nucleus and the bone marrow inflammation has started happening inter interleukin 1 nitrous oxide and uh, TNF, uh, tnf alpha start you can start looking there they start present there in that end plates and genetics plays role there people who say that okay my parents start having a back pain or disc problem in their 60s 40s 30s they may be talking about this end plate start getting degenerated and fissured during the early stages so we have found that the two times more nerves in this end plate instead of the annulus because we were talking about the annular tear before so hard hydrogen items they start becoming more acidic environment in the disc and they start uh, tapping those trpv1 which is a capsaicin receptors and sending the pain signals so the concept now evolve is that vertebrogenic pain end plates are more prone instead of disc end plates where the bone connect with the vertebral body on the mri go to your radiology rotations and learn how to read your own mris okay that's very important sometimes those radiologists they are so busy they miss what you're looking for so these are called modic changes modic is dr michael modic he is still in vanderbilt university in tennessee he listed start listing these modic changes 20 30 years ago when he was in cleveland clinic he said i am noticing in these mris that these changes has happening at the end plates and he called it modic 1 modic 2 modic 3 Modic 1 is, this is your T1, T2 weighted image on the MRI. When on your T1, you see the blackening around the disc along with the water here and white around this is called inflammation. As you all know that edema or infection on the T2 weighted image on the MRI is going to be like white looking. That's what happened. These are Modic 1 and these are Modic 2. 
And in this one, the red marrow is replaced by the white marrow. Both are white. And T1 weighted images, these are white and T2. And you can also say these are fat signals. Fat signals start getting more like same at both T1 and T2. And T3, sclerotic changes happening in those and trabecular start breaking and that's the modic 3 changes. The concept is that modic changes are directly related to the back pain. The people who have a modic 1, modic 2 severe, they are more prone to have back pain and they have a less or a worse outcome after the discectomy. Because discectomy is what? Discectomy is to removal of the disc. Discectomy, like appendectomy, removal of the disc. You are removing the disc, but the problem is not in the disc, problem is in the vertebral bodies or end plates. So, we found that, okay, people who have the modic changes, if they go for surgical intervention, the outcome is not as great as we're looking for. So, people start paying attention to these modic changes now. So, we started doing a trial on that called intercept intervention. What you all need to know is that, okay, we have determined by an aerogram or discogram the end plates are causing the pain, or now what do you need to do? So this intercept procedure came into the market. It's FDA approved now. So about, like I said, that there are 200 patients we have did so far in the entire United States. And this is approved for only from L3 to S1 vertebral bodies. So what we do is that we burn that vertebral body, uh, the busy vertebral nerve. We burn that busy vertebral nerve so that pain pathway is blocked. We are currently working so that if I can inject the stem cells in that end plate level and grow that end plate again and I burn the nerve so that I can basically cure the patient issue. Instead of just like, okay, I'm blocking the pain pathway, which is important, the patient will be having a pain uh, a relief from it. It's basically a non-surgical procedure. It's called intercept. You can Google it, it's a video about it. And what I do is that I put a trocar access cannula through the pedicle into the vertebral body, access, create a channel by a channeling or a nitinal probe, and then put a radio frequency probe and burn that nerve. So I have to burn one nerve here and one upper to cover both the superior end plate here and inferior end plate here of this basic vertebral nerve. I think this little video may not be playing here. Okay, what happened after that, when you burn, you will see start seeing this seven to 10 millimeter circular lesions. If the radiologist does not know that what is this, they're gonna call, start calling you, I'm seeing some metastatic lesions in the bone. But that's not the metastatic lesion, these are the after effect of those basic vertebral nerve ablations which you see here, modic, this is a T2 weighted image, you see whitening here, and this is also that's like modic 2 changes here. Six months post treatment, this is what happened into those MRIs. We did the clinical trial. First it's study design, study design is available in detail. I'm gonna be just for the sake of time, I'm just passing because I have a lot of material to cover. So anybody who is interested to get the detail, bottom line, Visual analog scale, short form 36, and ODI, Oswestry index questionnaire for disability, all improved. Disability score down, anal pain score down, and patient is functional with this short term. Even the study was so successful, and the next, that this is the, showing the 10 point reduction in ODI, 20 point reduction in ODI, 62%. 50% is a criteria to, okay, if, the, if we get 50% relief of the patient's symptoms, we are successful. Three months later, FDA cleared us, okay, you're good to go. This is a good procedure. And this 2019, it was presented in North American Spine Society, which is like a biggest uh, spine society in uh, Canada, US. It was presented there and everybody acknowledged that because until, unless NAS put their stamp, it doesn't, insurance does not bother it. They don't pay for it. SMART trial is a second step, which we did that randomized double-blind sham control placebo trial, 15 places in the US and three in the U. At the bottom line is that it's a success. ODI, Oswestry Index Questionnaire for Disability and Visual Analog Scale, even up to two years, 
50% plus reduction in the patient's symptoms. They may have other level problem or other disc herniation or other source of pain, which we'll talk, but intracep procedure is a very novel procedure for end plate pain for a lower back, in other words. Now, other intervention for the disc disease herniations are, this is a disc herniation, if somebody wants to know what is disc herniation, it's called protrusion. You can see that hydrated discs, degenerated discs, the nucleus is degenerated here. You can see the degenerated discs are more likely to herniate, and this is called disc protrusion, central area, paracentral or subarticular zone. So, what I do in those cases, sometimes I put the right L5S1 depending patient symptoms. You guys have heard about the thing called sciatica, sciatica, sciatica. In my clinical practice, that does not exist. It's mostly radiculopathies when I isolate which contributing branch of the sciatic nerve is a source of a pain. So it could be the L5 coming from under the L5 pedicle here, or it could be the S1. When the patient complain of the posterior buttock pain, posterior thigh pain, posterior calf pain, little toe pain, that's your S1 nerve. What are the possible reasons for S1 radiculopathy? Could be the L5 S1 disc or could be L4 5 disc, which is pressing on those nerves. So I perform those right L5 S1 epidural blocks, putting the needle going oblique approach, putting the needle right there, putting the contrast dye, making sure it's not being taken up by the blood vessels. And then after I finish the L5, if I feel that patient has both symptoms, L5 and S1, then I do both levels. Sometime right L4. So you can see the L4 nerve comes right in this foramen. L5 here, S1 here. So you can see the L4 disc here. L3, 4 disc, L4, 5 disc. You see the osteophytes start getting formed here. Degenerated disc, neural foramen are going to be tight. And that's L4 radiculopathy, more like ant anterolateral thigh and medial leg. So students, L4, L5, S1, S2. So these are the contributing branching to your sciatic nerve, which get formed in your buttock, mid buttock area in greater sciatic notch, right? Now around the piriformis muscle. So this is a, not the sciatica, primary care physician can call it sciatica because if I am gonna say, oh, you have a heart pain, I do not know if it's a MI or CHF or something, right? It's because it's not my specialty. In my specialty, orthopedic surgeons, the neurosurgeon, they have to be specific what exactly the source, what should I decompress to pay, make the patient feel pain better. So this is a showing little lateral view how this dye spread and goes behind the disc. So AP view, AP view, sometimes we get the big diagram here. You can see there's a filling defect here. This is a dorsal root ganglion here. The dye is going around that door, DRG. And this is just like I'm showing you the um, different kind of spread of the dye in L4 area. Again, this is like now combining L5, L4 on the right side and on the left side. Patient can have uh, bilateral symptoms too. So you target each specific areas to get the maximum benefit. Sometimes there are too many, then you have to go with one central approach. I don't get like simple cases. This is a patient who, she's like 93 years old, patient who has this effusion stent from the thoracic spine to the lumbar spine with SI joint particle uh, screws. So I have to go into the S1 foramen. This is the S1 foramen, needle going here and the dye spread here. On the lateral view, the needle coming all the way down and this is spread of the dye. So my target is this disc and the S1 nerve root. Sometime I perform bilateral S1 epidural blocks. So this is a spine, you can see it's a scoliotic spine, right? You can see even the slippage happening. Look at the disc level here. So these are not sometimes simple cases. We're not getting a 20, 30 years old patients every time. We get all 60, 70, 80 years old, and these are all the degenerated spine, putting medicine, okay, patient right L4 and left L4, radiculopathy. This patient, I have put the spinal cord stimulator as well. You can see this is the lead, this is spinal, uh, the IPG, implantable pulse generator. I'll talk about it when I'm talking about the spinal cord stimulator. These are the spine injection when I perform in a cervical spine. C5 radiculopathy, six, seven, and T1. All you can see the area of pain distribution. Now I have like a four nerve to target. In C-spine, I don't go at isolated level. I go in a central approach, interlaminar approach. This patient has a C5, 6, C4, 5 fusion done. And now the segment below is wearing out. So what I do is that I went to the interlaminar approach. You can see 
the needle coming right behind here, this is uh, epidural space, where your, your spinal cord, you are just like a two millimeter, one millimeter away from your spinal cord. So these are not that you should be like grab a needle and start putting in patient's neck. You can paralyze a patient. There are cases people have done it. If it's an isolated C7 injury, this is what I do. I put that needle into the transforaminal approach, into the neural foramen, put the dye there, make sure this is spreading and that it's not disappearing. When it's not disappearing, it means it's not in the blood vessel space. That's what you have to do under live C arm or live fluoroscopy. You cannot do it blindly. Because if this dye goes into the radicular artery and if you injected that methylprednisolone is a particulate matter, you can clog that radicular artery which can ultimately cause the necrosis of your spinal cord and patient can have a um, hemiplegia. I need to know where is my deadline, what can I not do? I need to know my limits. What is safety comes first. If I see a cervical spine like this where the spinal stenosis is very, very tight spine here, you can see the spinal cord, C2, C3, C4, 4, 5 level is very tight. You can see the spinal cord running here. I will not put needle there because I know it's not safe. Patient have a myelopathy symptoms there, patient cannot walk, right, handwriting is disturbed, all the uh, cervical myelopathy. So my red zone is that I need to see that how much so. You will not do any cervical spine injection until unless you have MRI or CT scan because you need to know how tight the spine is. Caudal epidural, I learned through my fellowship, but I don't do it, it's just very basics. So you put in a sacral hiatus needle and you put the medicine there and this is what you see that all the spreading into the sacral nerves, the needle goes into the uh, sacral hiatus right here. Complications from the injection of the epidural blocks, it could be from needle, it could be from the steroid. Steroid, you all know that Patients start getting hyperglycemia, patients start getting increased blood pressure, they start feeling hard jittery anxiety, and these are all the steroid effects. Needle effects could be infection because you may trap that staph aureus from the skin and take it all the way to deep into the spine. Infection is possible, but so far, thanks Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, not a single case of any infection or any complication in my uh, 16 years of career. Facet joint injection, if, keep remembering that basic slide of source of pain generators. So we talked about the disc, nerve block, discogenic pain. I will talk more other intervention for the disc, which is discectomies and as well as those uh, transdiscal biacuplasty. But now because shortage of time, I'm going just like surfacing them, okay? Facet joints. This is a cervical spine model, intervertebral disc. You can see in a sup inferior articulating process and superior articulating process make this cervical facet joints. C23, between the second and third, if you feel the patient has a headache right here in the posterolateral part of the head, don't call every single person who has a head called a migraine. It can be referred from cervical spine. Or most of the time I feel oh, my head hurts and I went to a neurologist and he started me on the sumitriptan, Merg, all these um, migraine uh, medications. So what C23 can posolateral headache, five, six, upper shoulder pain. Get confused multiple time with the shoulder pathology, but it could be referred from C5, 6 facet joint. Periscapular pain could be C6, 7 pain. So these are the cervical facet joint is called a referred pain, not radicular pain referred pain, somatic riffle, somatic. So this is a lumbar spine facet joint. If you see the uh, sap of the lower vertebrae or IAP of the upper one, make the facet joint. That's a four or five joint. And each joint supplied by a medial branch from the top and medial branch from the bottom. So these, reason I'm talking to you, those because those are the target of intervention. Lumbar spine pain can be referred like that. So when I do the facet joint block, these are the facet joints. You put a needle into the facet joint, put a small amount of dye, like in 0.1 millimeter, 0.1 ml. So you put a dye and get a good orthogram, make sure it's not taken out by blood vessels. So this is called facet joint blocks. And then you may or may not do a medial branch block. Medial branches come right here into the eye of that Scotty dog. 
Any of you have word, heard the word Scotty dog before? Not sorry for you, but students. <laughs> Scotty dog is basically a spine presentation on x-rays. Okay? If you see this, this is the ear of the Scotty dog, nose of the Scotty dog, foot of the Scotty dog, tummy and rear legs and the tail. So ear of the one dog, foot of the other dog, make the joint. That's a superior articulating process, that's an inferior articulating process, this is a facet joint. Those joints are the synovial joints. They deteriorate just like your knee joints and hip joints. So they also become a source of pain. Similarly, these are the cervical facet joints. Like I mentioned, I target the epidural space for the disc and the nerve, but I target these joints, C5, 6, you see the needle in the joint and you see the dye in the joint. Same thing like a 4, 5, you see the dye in the joint. So you have to do these procedure under C-arm or fluoroscope. You cannot do it uh, without image guided. So this patient, if you see, has a C6-7 fusion, the plating done because of C6-7 disc herniation. With this fusion, look at this facet joint here. It's very arthritic, there's some intra-articular fluid in there. Patient has a C6-7 periscapular pain. I block this joint, patient pain disappears. So it means that fusion is holding good, but there's another a source of pain de develop in that patient. So once I confirm, these joints are not going to do very well with the steroid for long term, maybe six weeks, eight weeks kind of relief. Then what I do in those patients, I ablate those medial branches. So medial branches, like I said, this is a joint. You can see the branch from the dorsal ramus is give you medial branch, intermediate branch, and lateral branch. Medial branch goes to the, give a branch to the joint above and joint below. So what we do is that we put those needles at right there at this junction and we burn that nerve. These you can see that my target here is three, four, and five. Five nerve is on S1 superior articulating process. You guys all know that we have a seven vertebrae in C-spine and we have eight nerves. So that's where the nomenclature changed. If I have to burn the, C, uh, the L3 nerve, I have to target the L4 sap. So that's where the nomenclature changed. So this is uh, my procedure room. This is a live patient I was doing, and this is a generator we need to ablate those nerves. We put those needles after placing the needles. If you see this little tiny marker here, so that's an area which I'm going to produce a lesion. And there's like a multi-gen uh, generator which we produce like three nerves at the same time. We apply the grounding pad and the C-arm, we check the lateral view because if you see this is a neural foramen from the nerve coming out. You do not want to singe or burn the nerve, motor nerve root. Otherwise, the patient is going to have a leg pain or weakness. If you're going to damage the nerve or damage the myelin sheath or axon, it's going to have a weakness there. Similarly, I do the cervical facet joints, cervical middle branch ablation. Joint block confirmed, then we burn the nerves there. This is called endoscopic rhizotomy. Sometime with maybe nerve is not sitting at its right spot and may escape. If we repeat that, then I put a scope, it's endoscope. Through the camera, I put a radio frequency, a probe, and burn the nerve by visualizing it. And that lasts about two, three years relief from that treatment. This is a little bit uh, research on that. Uh, or the supporting evidence that these radio frequency ablations does work. And Susan Lord from uh, New Orleans, she did study, and she found that have one, one lesion, 260 some days relief, have a repeat lesion, 400 plus, and the McDonald has repeated the same concept. Now Paul Dreyfus in Atlanta, I think he has replicated that study. Sacroiliac joint pain is important for all the female patients or female um, doctors. Sacroiliac joint is a joint between your spine and your pelvis. Females are five times more prone to have the sacroiliac joint pain. The reason is that because the pelvis broaden, loosen, and loosen during the second half of your menstrual cycle, and the ligaments are not as strong, 
and that's why they have more problem in the SI joint. Mobility in the SI joint pretty much stop happening at the age 60, 75. It's totally enclosed. Its joint is pretty much closed. But it causes a pain sometime when they fuse the uh, spine above, it affects the joint. Then I have the solution or the treatment for that. So SI joint is highly innervated in subcondyl space joint by S1, S2, S3 nerve and L5 and L4 nerves. So these are all the nerves supply the SI joint. It's also a proven source of pain, 15 to 30% of the time, the sacroiliac joint pain. Sacroiliac joint pain is more like into the buttock area and sacroiliac joint pain can refer to lateral leg. Not everybody has a nerve root pain or sciatica. SI joint, because if you see S1, S2, S3 area, if you see the distribution, it's called somatic referral pain. So you have to find out is the SI joint pain I'm targeting or if it's a nerve root, L5 nerve root pain I'm targeting. Okay. So this is a sacroiliac joint. If you see this is a joint needle right there and we put diagnostic block to confirm is SI joint pain. Patient gonna feel better in five minutes. Now you confirm is SI joint pain. Although the spine looks abnormal, but don't go what MRI looks. Go what you feel that patient symptoms are. Do your clinical exam. Okay, where are the patient's problem? Is my uh, provocative maneuvers are positive for this or not? And then you go from there. So like I said, the SI joint pain can go here. If I give you this picture, 90% of the primary care physician is going to call, oh, this is sciatica. When they come to me, no, this is not sciatica. I have seen myself when I put, inject in the SI joint, patient, I felt pain in my leg. Did you touch my nerve? No, I did not touch your nerve. Did you SI joint pain? So, disc, facet, and SI joint pain. What is their referral pattern? Very similar. Facet joint pain does not go below the knee. L5, S1, facet joint can pain go like this too. So, you extend the patient's spine, you load patient's spine, and ask the patient, where are you feeling pain? Is what kind of pain? Once I confirm the SI joint pain, I ablate those SI joint nerve. These are all the lateral branches coming from S1 foramen, S2, S3 foramen through a cool leaf method because with the cool leaf method, I can produce a little wider lesion in three dimensions. So I should not let those nerve escape. So that's what we do for SI joint after the diagnostic block confirmed, therapeutic block does not give them more than three, four, five months of relief or even after that I put a stem cells there, uh, exosomes or amniotic fluid allograft, then I ablate the uh, cool leaf. I do SI joint fusion. So these are all percutaneous procedures. The two companies are competitors to each other, SI metry and SI joint fusion. This is a true fusion they claim and I do mostly this, less I do this, used to do uh, SI uh, fusion by uh, using the eye fuse, this is SI metry. So I'm just going to give you a little bit of uh, information on the SI metry. You decorticate the joint by putting a cannula, put a bone graft, autologous bone, and then put a two screws. Put the needle there, decorticator, decorticate, put the allograft, and then you put the two screws. The one is the more, more cannulated one and one more like preventing the rotation because the SI joint has a mobility of two to three millimeter depending on the age. So we just want to fuse that joint. These are all done percutaneously. You do not need to open the, anything on that, okay? And this is the other way we put three dowels put the, uh, across the SI joint and fuse it. I have seen a failure with these procedures. Sometimes these dowels get absorbed and they still have the uh, persistent pain. And if they have still have a persistent pain and I've confirmed it, then I put this peripheral nerve stimulators. I put along the lateral branches, which are also called the colonial nerves. Have you heard the word superior colonial nerves, inferior colonial nerves? Yes or no? C-L-U-N-E-L, colonial nerves. Go type on the Google today, okay? Colonial nerve are superior around the iliac crest and these are called the medial colonial nerve along the lateral branches. These are the natter's anatomy. And these are superior colonial nerves. Sometimes we put the stimulator both to cover the SI joint. 
Now kyphoplasty, have you guys heard about this kyphoplasty before? Vertebroplasty, kyphoplasty. Okay, these are the percutaneous vertebral augmentation for compression fractures. What we do, we put those cannulas into the vertebral bodies. We balloon, these are all the balloons. We inflate the balloons, put those trabeculates impacted because the pain in your spine from those compression fracture is not from the fracture basically, is from those shear forces between those trabeculates. And the nerve ending, you all know that is all there, the busy vertebral nerve. So we put the cement in there and that immediately relieve the patient's compression fracture pain. Mostly females suffer from this compression deformities after their menstrual cycle stop because they are not, bones are not very thin, they are more osteopenic or osteoporotic. So you have to treat them for their osteoporosis along with it. This is not like osteoporosis treatment, it's a compression fracture treatment. So this is what the little detail about that procedure, we put those cannulas and we do that. Now sacrum, the sacral ala where it makes the SI joint can have a sacral insufficiency fracture. For that, I perform the sacroplasty. I put two cannulas, like this area has become fractured. I put two cannulas and put cement in there just to stabilize that sacral ala. So it should not further compress because it's going to stress the SI joint and it's going to make your spinal curvature too and stress other alignment issues. So this is what how I perform those sacral sacroplasty, put those two cannulas. S1, S2, S3 foramens right here, SI joint right here. And you can see the lateral view, how, where we are in the sacral body. So, this is what the sacral insufficiency fractures on the CT scan. CT scan is a better uh, diagnostic test for SIF uh, rather than MRI. MRI you usually do uh, to see if there's any edema there, to see if it's acute or chronic. Acute fracture you treat chronic compression in SIF you don't. Now go back to now going to a spinal cord stimulator. Spinal cord stimulator is being in the market since 1967 by Jock and Shelley. She's the one, Dr. Shelley, who has basically put the first spinal cord stimulator in the cervical spine. She's a neurosurgeon and since then it has evolved tremendously. So the novel concept of S, uh, the stimulation is you know that you have a fiber, B fiber, C fibers. A fibers are alpha, beta, gamma, delta. These are all myelinated fibers, A and B. C fibers are not myelinated fibers. Your pain carried through A, delta, and C fibers. A, delta are myelinated. You know the myelin sheath. Your impulses travel from nodes of Ranvier's to Ranvier's jump. So they are more, the velocity is more, right? And unmyelinated fibers are more like preganglionic and postganglionic. Those are not fast fibers. So the pain carried through A delta fibers and C fibers. Your touch, pressure, vibration are carried through A alpha, beta, gamma, right? So this is the concept behind the spinal cord stimulation. When the sensation, let's say there is a pin prick happen to your finger, pain sensations are coming to your cell body in the, your DRG, dorsal root ganglion, from their posterior horn and enter into the posterior horn and there is something called substantia nigra, which is a lamella 5. From there it crosses spinal thalamic tract and goes to your ventral postural nucleus of your thalamus and then to postcentral gyrus, right? Remember that? Your anatomy? If you not, memorize your anatomy if you want to be in more in an interventional field, surgical field. Anatomy plays everything there. So, when this happened, have you seen that some ant has bite you or something, you start rubbing it? What you do? You stimulating those A alpha beta fibers. So my the temperature touch sensation supersedes my A delta C fibers. So that is why you start rubbing so that my pain fiber should not carry signals to my brain. My touch and vibration get the signals to the brain. So this is called, this led to uh, Dr. Wal Milzak and to a theory called gate theory. This gate theory happens here. That if those fibers, you stimulate A delta, fi you stimulate A alpha beta fibers, myelinated fibers, your pain fibers may not 
carrier signals to your brain. So this is what right behind the gate theory. We put this spinal cord lead there in to stimulate those nerve fibers. This is called spinal cord stimulation. It's the same concept, deep brain stimulation for your Parkinson's disease. We do spinal cord stimulation for pain problems. We do a peripheral nerve stimulation so that we can block the pain or cover the pain, not block the pain, cover with the tingling vibration sensations. So this is how the spinal cord stimulation works. Richard North, he is a neurosurgeon in Johns Hopkins University. I happen to be worked with him for only two months, super surgeon. He has done a study with Dr. Kumar that if the patient has a one surgery and put the patient to second surgery versus one surgery and put into the stimulation, the patient who had a one surgery and a stimulator did a lot better than repeated spine surgeries. So this is a showing that how the pain score goes down with the stimulation. Patients are functional. Sometimes you cannot reverse the pathology. Nerves are scarred. You have to do something so the patient can be functional. They can live their life. They can walk, they can play, they can golf. So these are all the studies proving that spinal cord stimulation is a treatment approved by FDA. There's not only one, it's the repeated, repeated studies we have done. How do I do that? This is your APV of the spinal cord, uh, the spinal um, uh, anatomy. If you see the interlaminar space, what I start like a two segment below, put my cannula right there, then I go to lateral view. After the lateral view, I make sure that I am approached right there where the ligamentum flavum is. You remember that where I talk about the anatomy, there's a ligamentum flavum? So ligamentum flavum is right there. When you enter your needle into the flavum, you have a different feeling, textural feeling in your fingers. So then I take the stylus out, and then I use a loss of resistance glass syringe. I brought that spinal cord stimulation lead. If somebody want to see later, I can show them. So you put the needle there, and then after I put the second needle right underneath the first one. Why I do that? When I was in my fellowship training, I put one lead, a needle from here, one from the other side. Then I started feeling that, okay, if I'm going here, I already anesthetized the track of my needle. So why I make the patient suffer again? Because lidocaine, because of acidic pH, it burns. And patient doesn't like it. And these are all done patient awake. There's no sedation for this. And then I put this spinal cord lead there through this needle. So you see this one needle second and those two leads and that what looks like behind the spinal cord so these are the electrodes they get connected to outside implantable pulse generator to generate those electricity to stimulate those a alpha and beta fibers so these are called percutaneous leads placement of the spinal cord mostly our back and the lower limbs I have to place those leads around T7, T8, T9 area. This is a very interesting patient, which I did about three months ago. She's 34, have a pelvic pain. She just like cannot have her family life because of that severe pain. Endometriosis, multiple time have all this, uh, GYN has done the uh, resection, laparoscopy, but still a horrible pelvic pain perineal area pain. So I did that pudendal nerve block, did not do much. I said, okay, let's do the spinal cord stimulation. In that lady, I put the four leads instead of two. So I can cover her spinal cord and I cover her the paravertebral para gutters so I can cover the nerves. So she has about 60%, 70% relief. At least now she's functional and she can have her family life. So this is for the inguinal pain. This is, I put the cervical spinal cord stimulator right behind if you see this is c1 but the upper border of c2 but on the ap view you can see more they are more diverted because this lady she is like 24 years old have a motor vehicle accident has a horrible uh, pain in her neck and head area since then i saw her at the age 34 after trying multiple treatment if you see these needles i was doing the radiofrequency ablation also every six eight months on her this as i put 
to cover her back of the head pain, headache, neck pain, upper limb pain. She has a thoracic outlet syndrome also from that surgery because of the fracture of the, uh, her, uh, of the first rib. So upper limb pain, neck pain, headaches. So this is what I covered with this stimulation there in her cervical spine. This patient has two systems. One I put in the cervical spine, one in the thoracic spine. This is one pulse generator, this is a second pulse generator. She has a complex regional pain syndrome. Have you heard about this? CRPS. You touch patient, they scream. Simple touch is called allodynia. I will ask, make sure Dr. Shweb asks these questions from you guys on your next uh, lectures, okay? Allodynia hyperesthesia. This lady was 36, 38 years of age. She cannot even wear her clothes because her body is so sensitive, sensitized. Her name was Sarah. I can mention that because I'm not going to mention the last name. I said, Sarah, when are you going to get married? He said, nobody can touch me. How can I get married? I have so horrible pain. I ends up putting two stimulator and thanks, she's a functional and she has a one baby now. So this is what two pulse generators, she controls the, her pain by this tingling, so she will, she will not feel pain, but she's feeling tingling vibration all over her body. This patient has a prostate cancer with the radiation, with the radiation and chemo, his pelvic nerves are pretty much damaged. So I put the retrograde leads, I went from the upper and uh, slide them under in the, in, in the caudal direction. These are a pelvic lead, you can see. Here I'm not stimulating the spinal cord. You guys know the spinal cord finish at what level? Not for doctors, students. L1, L2 levels, right? Underneath is all cauda equina. All those like the horse tail kind of nerves. So these are all the sacral nerves. So we, I end up putting that uh, sacral nerve stimulation on that patient to see I can stimulate the sacral nerve to cover his pelvic pain. Then I started putting those doors. If there is a post-herpatic neuralgia, one nerve, isolated nerve, severe chest wall pain, I put the dorsal root ganglion stimulators, DRG. We go from opposite side, here is the dorsal root ganglion, we put the lead right onto the dorsal root ganglion. If you see the cross section, DRG right there, here is my lead. So that stimulates the dorsal root ganglion where the cell body of that efferent nerve roots are there. All the pain goes through the dorsal DRG. So we stimulate there just to cover the isolated pain. Just one nerve root pain, mostly in the uh, sacral nerve or thoracic lumbar nerves. But if this beyond, then I put the peripheral nerve stimulator like tibial, median, ulnar nerves. So these are the surgical lead which my surgeon's colleague, they implant because it's called pedal lead. It cannot go through the needle. It do have to do a laminotomy, or make a hole in the lamina of the spine. But I do these percutaneous leads. I can do that. It's outpatient surgery. Basically, you do it in like a couple of hours and patient is gone. This is the remote control charger and this is the implantable pulse generator. Now, there is a montage which is the MRI compatible. You guys have seen the pacemaker, right? Pacemaker, you put the generator, you put a lead in the heart. Here you put a battery in somewhere in the lumbar area and put the lead in the spine. That's a novel concept about it. So this is MRI compatible now. They used to be like a big size. Now they are just like very small, about two by two inches. And this is like you put on the top of it and charge it, it's rechargeable. Complications, fibrosis around that lead, infection, migration two to three percent of the time. The leads migrate, but the number of contacts are so high that we are able to cover the patients there. Now, percutaneous dis uh, uh, decompressive laminotomy. This is for spinal stenosis. So the patient who does spinal, uh, gets spinal stenosis, mostly they are 50 plus. So spinal stenosis is, can happen in a central canal, lateral recess, or neural foramen area. If you remember your spine anatomy, spinal canal. Okay? So this is for... Uh, decompressing the ligamentum flavum. You might come across there's a word called hypertrophied ligamentum flavum or you might come across there is a buckling of ligamentum flavum. Young age, our ligamentum are straight, not this. Old age, they start buckle. 
This is called hypertrophied ligamentum flavum. From the front lilar disc bulge, from the back, ligamentum flavum. So we start decompressing percutaneously through a tissue skull and bone sculpture. So what we do is that you can see the, how hypertrophied ligamentum here is. See all this trefoil kind of appearance? So if I just take it out, the ligamentum flavum, by tissue sculpting, patient going to have a relief from his neurogenic claudications. So if we have a spinal stenosis patient, we do epidural block. If that doesn't work, then we do mild, minimally invasive laminobin decompressive. Now they also call it pile, the percutaneous, so there are two companies. Before we ask them to do the beta fusion. So what we do in those patients, first I do epidurogram, I inject the dye where I find the tight ligamentum flavum, put the tissue sculpture and get that flavum out. You can see that this is a bone sculpting. Sometimes I cannot access the ligamentum flavum, so tissue sculpt, the bone sculpting thing, I go into the inferior part of the lamina, I make those osteophytes uh, decompress and then um, uh, put the tissue sculpting uh, probe and get that ligamentum flavum out and then open up your uh, spinal canal. So studies showing and uh, uh, still in a process but have a good outcome for those patients who cannot go a major decompressive surgery in their 70s and 80s and 90s. Endoscopic lumbar spine surgery. This is a new in the market and approved this year the, in um, 2019 by the NAS. NAS is NASS, North American Spine Society, that they approved this uh, surge, uh, endoscopic uh, discectomies. It just does reduce the number of open spine surgeries or open discectomies, but this is for the patient. They do not altering any structure. So novel concept, again, 1975 in, in Japan and 1995 in the US now. When it was like people start doing the endoscopically, removing the discs. Okay, like I mentioned in 2019, they have just recommended coverage because they have to recommend coverage before the Medicare approves it. As I said, these are mostly uh, you know, by the CMS, Center for Medicare Services. So over there is a national, like people who are at 65 plus, government pay for the 80% of their charges. So our major societies has to approve those treatments that these are uh, beneficial without much risk. So. Again, the indication is neurogenic claudication. You guys know the leg pain can come from the neurogenic claudication, vasculogenic claudications, peripheral neuropathy, peripheral veins leakage. All these things cause leg buttock pain with standing and walking. Again, history is very important. You have to. Spinal stenosis does not cause back pain. It causes leg buttock leg pain. Claudications occur when you stand and walk. When the patients cannot have these procedures, when they have the, um, cannot, they are on the blood thinners from aspirin, plavix, or cumidin, they have bleeding issues and they have extensive cardiopulmonary problems, they cannot have the sedation. So this is a little scope I'm showing you that we have that working channel and then the irrigation channel and then this is like a radio frequency probe which we decompress that uh, discs in the lateral recess and foraminal stenosis and then I sometimes use the uh, interlaminar approach when the disc is more in the central area or paracentral area then I use the uh, interlaminar approach to decompress that disc. Spinal uh, interspinous spacers is also for the spinal stenosis what we do we put a spacer between the spinous process and it de it extract that and open up the space here. When the space gets open, the neuroforamina get open. And the nerve root coming out of the neuroforamina, they get some breathing so that they do not cause leg pain or claudications. Same indication as spinal stenosis for the mild, for the spacers, it all how you want to select those patients. Patient who has more like a thin bone, you do not want to do this because the spinous process may get fractured by that hard structure. So, but have to done the MRI or CT scan before and you have to plot out all your interventions before you do it. You can even um, do it for the chordicoina. These are not indication for that, okay? So chordicoina, no, surgeons direct. This is what I was talking. Sometime 
we find that okay patient does not have a disc herniation or they come for the back leg pain we know is a disc herniated and pressing on the nerve that's not true here is a cyst facet joint has produced a synovial cyst you guys have heard about the baker cyst right where is the baker cyst behind the knee what is that is the intraarticular fluid is osteoarthritis making more fluid and fluid finds a levicus link where this go and make a cyst same thing synovial cyst here the facet joint producing fluid sometimes they produce extra and their cyst develops what i started doing is mostly surgeons when they go to the surgeon surgeons okay you need a facetectomy and you need a fusion because if you remove the facet joint from the back spine become unstable they have to fuse the joint fuse the segment put the two screws in the pedicle and put a bar around it and then put a uh, horizontal bar so have to stabilize the segment this called fusion which costs about 80 90000 dollars there so it is a big reward for the surgeons also if they want to do a fusion so i said okay let's find something different that i can save the patient from surgery it's not this is not fda approved okay it's just my own personal intervention i went i go into the joint put the die and go to the lateral view on the fluoroscope get the see where the cyst is this is getting filled with that or no that shows me the joint is communicating with that cyst and this is the hard structure when i tell my colleague oh you cannot do that they are very like a very like thick structures you cannot even uh, take it out with the knife is very difficult how can you uh, take it out with the needle so i fill that with the dye and lidocaine now i confirmed with bo- both my ap and lateral view on the fluoro on the lateral view then i go and put a pressurize it with 5 ml of the lidocaine and the ivp dye uh, mixture and i tell the patient when this going to get filled if i'm targeting this l5 s1 patient might feel an s1 distribution pain because it's going to distend it's going to displace the s1 nerve root and then suddenly it pops when it's pops it means all the fluid has released now i want to make sure that this does not develop again either i put the stem cells or i put a little steroid sometimes the first attempt is not successful i repeats it so far 12 cases i have a success story their leg pain or radicular pain has disappeared by this percutaneous synovial cystic decompression these are all the synovial facet joint for the orthopedic uh, when you see this kind of joints in the 4551 45 is the most common level for developing the spondylolisthesis spondylolisthesis is a slippage of one bone or the other if i see this joint i tell the patient okay this coming next in 3 to 5 years you going to slip your spine but grade 1 grade 2 spondylolisthesis does not you have to do any surgical intervention anymore this is a fall in my backyard that's a spring in my backyard This is where I spend my time after my two kids have gone to San Francisco. This is a little snow. That's all I have for you on the theory. Questions. All right, now at the time for the questions. So question by our professor is what is the cost of spinal cord stimulation So spinal cord stimulator is a two step treatment or process one is called spinal cord trial trial is done in the office setting when i put those leads in my office and then stitch it onto the skin and the, the battery is just like outside your body and i'll show you when uh, we'll go into the hands on kind of experience so that is a trial we get paid somewhere from $2000 to $17000 depending is a workman's comp we are lucky to get 15 17000 if is a medicare they used to pay uh, $6000 but now they have dropped the price to $2000 our cost is about $200 so that's a trial price 
and uh, it takes me about uh, 20 minutes to somewhere 30 35 minutes to finish the whole procedure and because I have that representative from the company who gonna basically uh, stimulate the spine and uh, with that uh, computer programming so trial trial we send the patient home for five six seven days and they are in their natural environment when they can sleep sit stand walk that's a four posture five posture we have we are either lying we are either sitting standing or walking so I want those patients to be in their natural environment to see if their functions improved if their crankiness is improved because if they're in a chronic pain they are not gonna able to do their function they're gonna be very jittery cranky and even depressed so if those things improve then we choose them to go for permanent implant permanent implant is a cost about uh, in the hospital setting the company sell that device to the hospital for twenty eight thousand dollars and the hospital charge to Medicare about forty two thousand and if it's a commercial carrier and and the commercial carrier sometimes they pay get uh, I mean I have seen up to two hundred thousand dollars so but but that is a US model where is everything is crazy high because you can have this the I the battery which I showed you that is main cost twenty eight thousand dollars sometimes those battery for five years when they we have to replace that's what the price is mainly the battery price the leads they're just like not as much as uh, pricey as others are when we started, uh, uh, we, have a, we had a few patients and we wanted to uh, put in uh, the spine cost stimulator. And we initially started negotiating with uh, Medtronic and uh, they were offering different prices to India and uh, different prices in Pakistan. Pakistan was much higher than in India. So we were actually wanted the, the, to get the same prices that they were uh, offering in India. Uh, that could not uh, materialize. Later on, uh, we uh, negotiated a deal with uh, these uh, wireless people, the Stimwave. Stimwave, okay. Stimwave. And uh, we did actually three cases uh, here, all in uh, about 24 hours time, in one day. That was the first uh, wireless in, in this area. We did wireless because it was cheaper, much cheaper. That cost around uh, uh, 1100 uh, $1, dollars. Total complete. Uh, but do you have any experience with the, this wireless? Yeah, stream wave. I use the peripheral mostly, but central. Not central. Not do central because central. Uh, there are three companies mainly uh, for the central stimulation, as, as you mentioned, Medtronic. Yeah. I use Boston Scientific, Boston Scientific, and the third is the St Jude, which is now Abbott. Abbott bought the St Jude. And the stream waves and the neuro wave, all these are also uh, like a pulsed stimulation continuous stimulation all those things but wireless is also like the antenna is so hard to get it it breaks for the permanent one exactly. we are having a lot of uh, hardware problems correct with all, so, almost all of our patients plus you want to have a device, uh, device, uh, crab ho gaya, device ho gaya, so right so i am using that boston scientific because uh, patient feel a different stimulation with it it is just like if you have the BMW ride versus Toyota ride. So this is like the system. I used, used to do the Medtronic first, but I switched to the Boston Scientific. So now exclusively Boston Scientific. And for peripheral nerves, if I, let's say if I have the clonal nerve I'm stimulating, or if I'm stimulating the tibial nerve for tibial neuropathy, then I use the wireless stem wave. Because it's difficult to put the IPG there. You guys know what the bamboo spine is? Ankylosing spondylitis. When the spine starts getting fused naturally because of the disease process. So the bamboo is just like a tree. When you see that, it starts becoming like that tree, bamboo tree. That's called bamboo spine. If somebody wants to take the USMLE, that's going to be in there. Okay? So the bamboo spine, what is we can do correction? The one main thing, tell the patient, sleep on their stomach sleep on their stomach so that is what you correct for that so that becomes when they sleep they will not develop that kyphotic posture because they're sleeping on their stomach that's from the rehab standpoint if they have any pain 
or anything developed like a, they also develop diffuse idiopathic skeletal hyperstosis so then you just like see where is the pain the pain originators are those pain generators right so the facet joint disc disease nerve roots and mirror branches or if it's like a, the ligament or muscles then you treat symptomatically to those pains anti-inflammatory oral oral and NSAIDs there is no like injection or any, any intervention which we uh, can do for that it's just like we are sometimes we want to do some experiments but who's the funding party is Medicare no not gonna approve commercial care is not gonna approve so we are just stuck with that okay uh, only the oral anti-inflammatories NSAIDs which is ibuprofen naproxen Is the stimulating the spinal cord is a common sense? Stoma cells, stem cells. Stem cells, okay, sorry. So stem cells are, you guys know the pluripotent stem cells, totipotent stem cells. What are the stem cells? They are going to take the shape of the environment they are in. In our body, we have the stem cells circulating in our blood, right? They are constantly busy in doing our repair. They are doing our blood vessels repair from our peripheral vascular disease, our heart repair for all these heart problems and lungs problem and skin and everything. So those stem cells has a little chance to go to your joints. They said, oh, I'll take it later, right? So the stem cells, we start getting those stem cells, mesenchymal stem cells. We get from the bone marrow or from the adipose uh, tissue. So, injecting the stem cells in the spine and the disc is a great idea. We are working on it, but like I said in my presentation, they're all cash pain. If somebody come and okay, I, we buy, I mean, if I'm harvesting it from the bone marrow, my charges are $10,000. And uh, if I'm getting it from outside those uh, amniotic fluid allograft, then I buy it one ml for uh, seven hundred seven hundred dollars. So I need a two or three ml. So it's just like six or seven thousand to the patient. So those are I have injected on uh, one patient which has a spine surgery, and I injected in the disc L five S one. I injected L four five L five S one facet joint on both sides, and patient got significant improvement. That patient has a L five S one discectomy. They removed the small portion of the disc. She's young patient, 30, 31, 32 years old. And even I have put the stimulator in that lady, but stimulator taking care of leg pain, but not much back pain. She's not able to function, sit for long. So I said, let's do the stem cells. And she is now uh, four months out from that injection treatment and improve, I mean, feeling significant improvement. So it is a great idea that, okay, I have uh, reading on the literature that people are doing in a cervical spine in the area where the people have money. So they just uh, prefer to go for stem cell treatment instead of all other steroid blocks and mealer branch ablations and things like that. Side effects of the nerve block. Nerve you do not inject in the nerve. So nerve, where are we injecting? You have heard about the carpal tunnel, right? So you do the carpal tunnel blocks. So you infiltrate it around the nerve. So in my area, like we do for the spine, in the neural foramens. I go in the neural foramen, if you see in that picture, I inject the dye. If the first 0.01 ml of the dye patient scream about from the pain, it means you are in that dura of the nerve. Okay, just pull it back a little bit. But normally you went with your experience, you know that, okay, I am in the six o'clock of that pedicle. If I go to the more like a three o'clock from the left side, I am gonna hit the dura. So no, just pull back. There's a supra neural approach. There is a retro neural approach. There's an infra neural approach. These are more like hands-on kind of, how can I access? I look at my MRI myself. So I know where the nerve root is lying there in that patient. So then I determine accordingly. So the, the infection, nerve injury, flare up of the pain, that's possible with that neural foramen. 
especially if the disc is sitting in that foramen and the space is tight, you can also mechanically damage the nerve because you're pressurizing too much. So you have to tear it accordingly that, okay, how much space I have and how much volume I can put into that nerve. So as long as you're not injecting in the nerve, you are safe. You're not gonna do any demyelination or axonal injuries. So for students, if the patient has axonal injuries, you know the nerve has axon, right? There is a myelin sheath around it. Axon is more like controlling your strength and myelin is more controlling your sensations. So myelin demyelination occurs, then you have a tingling, numbness kind of feelings. If your axon get damaged, you're going to start getting weakness. So keep that in mind, axon, myelin. So as long as you're not injecting in the nerve, you're safe. Side effects, like I mentioned, from needle, those are the infection when you carry your staph aureus from your skin and also the nerve injury when you're injecting in the nerve. And from medication, which is mostly like those two medication I used, lidocaine in the nerve block, uh, and the steroid depo, uh, methylprednisolone, or celestone, or dexamethasone. These are the three long-acting steroids we use. So lidocaine toxicity is uh, there, but it's rare when you're only using one of one to five or 10 ml volume. Mostly when uh, we used to do those beer blocks, B-I-E-R, beer blocks for CRPS, when we infiltrate the whole arm with the 200 cc of lidocaine by applying a tourniquet, so then patient, we, monitor, we do it under uh, telemetry, make sure they do not develop arrhythmias and things are available and ready. So these are all like, I mean, in my experience, uh, cervical spine, when I do that nerve block, I tell the patient that these are possible that you may have a spinal headache if they have a CSF leak. But if there's no CSF leak, and if there is CSF leak, nothing to worry because you just need the occipital nerve blocks and that take care of their headaches. You give them the caffeinated fluid so that they can hydrate them. So because when you stand, your pressure drops or CSF pressure drops and that's called headache. When you lie, the headache disappears. That's called spinal headache. So spinal headache, infection, those are all the uh, possible side effects from nerve blocks.